So in the previous video lecture on Wuthering Heights, we had discussed uh, primary details about the novel. We had discussed uh, <clears throat> uh, the identification of the characters, the other details about the point of view, from whose point of view the novel is being read, so on and so forth. Uh, and I've also given you a timeline which will, which would help you uh, understand all the complex plot of the novel. And yesterday we described, uh, we discussed the identification of the characters again, so that it would help you remember. I've also given a family tree so that it would help you remember the complex characterization um, that you find in the novel. <coughs> yeah, uh, uh, so I'm forwarding on to the new slides for today. Uh, you can get these uh, timelines on uh, Wikipedia. I've taken it from there only. So today we are going to start uh, go into the novel uh, particularly and as we have done the previous novels we will go to the novel through characterization that is how we will go through. We will not go entirely into the plot and discuss how the story was written uh, uh, or what, uh, how the plot unfolds but we are going to study the plot from the point of view of the characters. So first, uh, and perhaps the most important in this novel is the character of Heathcliff. Uh, the image that you see is the British actor Ralph Fiennes, who acted the character of Heathcliff uh, in the BBC series. Uh, it's not a movie, it's a BBC series. You can get it on the torrent. Uh, it's a more or less good one. It's not a wonderful, fascinating, uh, adaptation, but with actors like Ralph Fiennes, uh, you can expect a certain amount of finesse. So the story, so the story of Wuthering Heights is actually the story of Heathcliff's love and Heathcliff's Heathcliff's psychology and Heathcliff's revenge. Most importantly, is is important is the word uh, revenge. Born and often taken up by Mr. Earnshaw, brought to Wuthering Heights mistreated by Findlay, befriended by Catherine, but then Catherine goes on to marry Edgar Linton because he's a gentleman and Heathcliff is not a gentleman, goes off to London, makes money, comes back and makes everyone pay because he did not get his way when he was growing up. And he makes, well, I make him sound like a villain, which probably to a certain extent he is, but we should also remember that Heathcliff was dominated and marginalized no end. So when Heathcliff comes back to take revenge, this is something that you must keep in mind. Uh, he, there has been ill treatment towards him for a good period of time. So the anxiety from which this revenge comes, you can, you can understand. Uh, so the novel teases the readers, uh, reader with the possibility that Heathcliff is something other than what he seems. That is, his cruelty is merely an expression of frustrated love for Catherine or for his sinister behavior to serve, sinister behavior serve to conceal the heart of a romantic hero. Now, as I said yesterday, Heathcliff is a Byronic hero. Now, Byronic hero is, is not like, as I told yesterday, is not like the stock mainstream romantic heroes, larger than life characters, virtuous, uh, brave. No, they are very psychological characters very humanly characters. Is it possible for any human being to be all good? Byronic heroes were very human. They had a dark side. They were lustful. They took indulgence in pleasures. They, uh, there was a very rapid, there was a very exuberant sexual energy within them. So it's not just just platonic love. It was also very uh, platonic romance or platonic attraction, uh, they would express their sexuality, their uh, sexual attractions, they, they had certain dark sides. And so the romance, the Byronic hero is someone who is detestable, but also very affectionate and agreeable. So as I told you, the, the metaphor that I used yesterday was a sweet poison. So Heathcliff is like a sweet poison. You know it's a poison, but you cannot uh, uh, stop from stop yourself from indulging in it even if you know that it is going to destroy you and certainly that is Heathcliff now we must understand how Heathcliff turns out to be so 
So Heathcliff is an orphan in London, especially uh, you must remember uh, London, which is almost into which is uh, London characterized by the Industrial Revolution. So we can be very well uh, sure that Heathcliff is not a not from the middle class. He's from the working class because he's an orphan. Had he been from the middle class, uh, his family would have had money and he would not have been an orphan. He would not have been passed out on the streets. So his life starts with rejection. And he's taken up by Earnshaw. And at Wuthering Heights, he's absolutely marginalized and dominated by Findlay. Findlay being the brother, always dominated over Catherine. And so Catherine was, in most cases, unable to stop this orgy of violence that Dick Findlay would uh, unleash towards Heathcliff. And it is this that makes Heathcliff realize uh, his social standing, that he's very, he's a working, he's a slave. And that is why he runs off to London in a bid to make fortune. Everyone in London was making a fortune due to the Industrial Revolution. There was a middle class. And he took a risk to get incorporated into the middle class, which he, which he could, which where he succeeded. He succeeded in doing that. Now, it is this that suppresses the desire, <coughs> the, 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 the love and the romance, <coughs> or the innocence of the love and the romance that he had in his heart. He had had a very uh, frustrating and a very hard turn in life. And this is only what we see when Heathcliff, uh, in Heathcliff's behavior after he's returning back to London, he wants revenge. He sees Catherine. Now Heathcliff could Heathcliff had never given Catherine the chance to express herself, explain the situation again, uh, uh, bringing bringing out the gender roles in Victorian London. The women does not represent herself. It is the male who represents the women. So Catherine Heathcliff never gave uh, Catherine the opportunity to explain the situation or explain what is there in her heart. She, he continued to misunderstand Catherine, and and that is why he indulges in this in this in this orgy of violence and revenge. Catherine was something that he held very dear to his heart, heart and. Uh, he would. He was not going to let Edgar or the Lintons enjoy Catherine, or let Catherine enjoy this life of a gentle woman for which she had rejected uh, Heathcliff. Just like that. <coughs> uh, we expect Heathcliff's character contains such a hidden virtue because he resembles a hero in a uh, in a. Or romance novel. Now his hidden virtue is his discipline, is his determination with which he goes to London and makes a life out of uh, out of everything for himself. His hidden virtue is the purity of the love that he has for Catherine that he harbors to the day that he till the day that he uh, died. And his undoing is his malevolence. His undoing is his malevolence that he holds. The grudge that he holds, he does not let go. He does not let love a chance. He, he is hell-bent on revenge and it is this malevolence that lets him, uh, it is this malevolence that uh, destroys everything, that burns the whole structure down, destroys both the families, the aunt, uh, the Lintons, destroys Heathcliff. And the next point about his character is, is, is uh, is something that we get associated via his marriage to Isabella, Edgar Linton's uh, sister, is his abusive, pure, sadistic nature. Uh, <clears throat> he's projected as someone who is who takes pleasure in giving pain because the way he uh, he's abusive to Isabella, and he almost like takes pleasure in seeing how much pain Isabella can take before she comes back again, desiring love from Heathcliff. But again, this should be remembered that. Isabella in Heathcliff's life is nothing but a pawn uh, towards his ultimate goal of destroying uh, the life of Edgar Linton and his wife, Catherine Linton, the girl that he loved. 
but then again uh, this gives him no this gives us no excuse or this gives his character no excuse uh, for us to it just excuse his malevolence these are strong points of his character which we must contend with so he may be a, a romantic hero but his character degenerates he brings down his own downfall <clears throat> Now again, uh, this is something which uh, is important in the sense that it brings forward uh, the class structure. Heathcliff seems to embody the anxieties that the book's upper class and middle class audience had about the working class. The reader may easily sympathize with him when he's powerless as a child terrorized by Hindley Earnshaw. Uh, but he becomes, becomes a villain uh, when he acquires power and returns to Wuthering Heights with the money and trappings of a gentleman. <clears throat> so when uh, Heathcliff was a working class, we all sympathized with him, that he was dominated, he should not be dominated, and we felt absolutely sorry, empathetic, and sad for Heathcliff when Catherine decides to marry uh, Edgar Linton over Heathcliff, even though she truly loved uh, Heathcliff. And if you read the novel, Catherine tells Nellie that she and Heathcliff are one, and that she herself is Heathcliff, they, uh, their psychologies are one, and she, she can bear to live on this earth only because she knows that the air above her is the air that Heathcliff breathes and the ground below her is the ground on which Heathcliff lives. So Catherine's life is Heathcliff, but Catherine succumbs to the hegemonic manipulation of the Victorian society and marries Edgar Linton because, uh, well, a gentle woman uh, should not marry someone like Heathcliff. From the working class. But the moment Heathcliff himself becomes the middle class or the upper middle class, he has money and comes back and buys Wuthering Heights. He treats the other tenants, other persons as, or, as working class. He becoming financially more powerful than them starts dominating uh, them just like they had dominated him. So it's almost like a role reversal. So we might feel that Heathcliff being subjected to that domination would be sympathetic to them, but he's not. Whatever domination he was subjected to, he gives it back when he becomes the middle class or the upper middle class. Now we come to Catherine Earnshaw. Now this is again, I, refer, I forget the actor's name. Uh, this is from the BBC uh, series, Wuthering Heights that I was speaking to you about, where she acts uh, opposite to Ralph Fiennes' uh, Heathcliff. <clears throat> The Catherine is a character who's torn in torn. He's, he, she's torn in her identity. She's torn in her social standing. She's torn in torn in her psychology, and and it is best symbolized when she dies because her coffin is le, is 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 buried between that is buried by the side of Edgar, and when Heathcliff dies, he uh, gets buried by the side of Catherine. So he, Catherine is there between Edgar and Heathcliff, her conflicted loyalties. So even though Catherine psychologically always belonged to Heathcliff, literally, physically, Catherine was a conflicted personality, conflicted, she had conflicted loyalties. She could not let off uh, gentlewomanliness and being in the landed gentry. She could not take the risk, close her eyes and just go on with Heathcliff and give expression to their true love. She succumbed to society, but she could never even leave Heathcliff. And this is what characterized her life in the very last day, uh, till the very last day. Uh, her actions are driven in part by her social ambitions, which initially are awakened during her first visit at the Lintons, and which eventually compel her to marry Edgar, what I was speaking of. So she gets seduced by uh, the luxury and the gentlemanliness of the Lintons and she marries Edgar, uh, rejecting uh, someone like Heathcliff, who is, who, is, who is not a gentleman. And she pays the price for this. Uh, she pays the price for this, though uh, uh, Heathcliff does not directly indulge into any form of revenge on Catherine. Now, this is because Heathcliff, this is because Heathcliff truly and uh, he was in love with Catherine. So he does not uh, indulge direct, indirect confrontation with Catherine. He does 
in, uh, he gets into direct confrontation with Isabella, he gets direct confrontation on Edgar. So you must understand Heathcliff's psychology. Heathcliff wants to punish Catherine by punishing Edgar. And by doing that, disrupting their marital bliss, their marital life. Because he's unable to punish Catherine herself because of the love that he harbors for Catherine. And Catherine, till the very last day of her life, had, had loved Heathcliff and she goes to her grave being the person who has been unable to explain the situation to Heathcliff. Now, we all feel things might have been very difficult if after coming from London, coming back from London, Heathcliff would have given Catherine the opportunity to explain herself. An opportunity that Catherine does not get. So Heathcliff does dominate Catherine. Catherine's punishment is almost through this. She yearns for an opportunity for explanation. Heathcliff does not give one to her. And she dies with an absolutely disappointed and broken heart. Uh, she's also motivated by the impulses that prompt her to violate social conventions, love Heathcliff, throw temper tantrums around the moor. Uh, well, this thing is again Catherine. As I told you, Heathcliff is a Byronic hero. Heathcliff is someone who is not like the other heroes of those life, other gentlemen. He, he is someone very psychological. He's very... And, this seduces the affection of the female figures. First Catherine and then Isabella. For the first time, they see characters who are not living their lives by a more by a moral code of conduct, but they express themselves as they want to express. If they feel love, they would express their love. If they feel anger, they would express their anger. Uh, if they are, if they feel the passion in their heart. Uh, their actions express that they are passionate. And this makes her violate all forms of social conventions and love Heathcliff. There was no uh, hidden fact in Wuthering Heights that, Heathcliff, that uh, Catherine loved Heathcliff. Uh, and she did so, while she did so, she did it against, against her family, against the social conventions. And she would stop acting when she was with Heathcliff. She would stop acting like a gentlewoman. She would throw out, uh, she would roam about the moor. She would throw tantrums, express herself vehemently, uh, which are against the norms of you know, how a gentlewoman should behave. Now, Isabella Linton being a foil, foil means the opposite. See, just like Catherine is not submissive. Catherine loves Heathcliff, but does not submit to his love. Catherine goes to Edgar Linton, but does not submit to his love either. Continues loving Heathcliff. So she's not submissive, but Isabella is submissive. Even though Isabella is dominated, abused by Heathcliff, she returns back to Heathcliff time and again to be loved. The two women's parallel positions allow us to see their difference with greater clarity. Catherine represents wild nature in both her high and lively spirits and uh, her occasional cruelty, whereas Isabella represents uh, culture and civilization, both in her refinement and her weakness. What I was speaking. So even at a worst point, Isabella is still uh, adheres to the moral codes. She is submissive to her husband. However abusive her husband becomes. Catherine, she is white. She is human nature. She is impulsive. Even after marrying Edgar Linton, she is not able to love Edgar Linton. And she makes this clear to Edgar. that She is not being able to love Linton the way uh, that she had loved Heathcliff. And we will end the discussion on Wuthering Heights with the discussion on the themes, the destructiveness of a love that never changes. Well, this is again Heathcliff's entire orgy of, 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 of violence. So, and you ask yourself what brought on this violence and the answer that you get is, well, uh, it is love. It is Heathcliff's love or well, can we call it obsession? I don't think so. We can't call it obsession. We will call it love. But it is this love 
uh, which never changed and which brought the destruction of both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. The destructiveness of love. So for the first time in a novel, love is not valorized. Love is not being described in high ideals, that it's the best and the most wonderful thing in life. Uh, the ending of the novel is not happily ever after, but it shows the destructiveness of love. It shows jealousy, it shows the point, it shows abstract qualities associated with love like jealousy, like possessiveness, these qualities. Now you may uh, read uh, from, pause your screen and read what I have written here. Uh, this is again, this will help you make your answers. You can use these directly in your answers. Uh, the precariousness, precariousness of social class is again something which is very evident. Heathcliff is first uh, hated by Hindley because he's from the working class, he's an orphan. Uh, Catherine Orntraw marries Edgar Linton because, well, again, the same thing Heathcliff and Heathcliff is not of the social stature of Catherine. So social class consciousness becomes very important here. Uh, so this is our, uh, this is my lecture on Wuthering Heights. I am going to end this lecture here. This is all I think you need to do on Wuthering Heights. I, uh, I don't think you need to do anything more. Uh, so read up the summary, read up the characterization go through my video lectures, try to self-study and uh, I will upload notes. I have uploaded some certain notes on the picture of Dorian Gray and I will upload other notes for uh, Wuthering Heights. Uh, if you have any queries, feel free to contact me.